Hello everyone, today is 28th of October, now it's about 10 o'clock in the morning Moscow time. I'm Levan Gudadze and this is my first update for a day in which I will share all the main news that are making headlines in Russian media outlets and Russian language pages on different internet platforms. Later on today, towards the evening, I will publish my second update for a day on my Patreon and Boosty pages in which I will share all the additional main news that Russian media will report about during their day. That's been said, before I start uh, this uh, update, dear friends, let me uh, let me ask you if I may to click that like button and leave some commentary. This is the only way we can somehow influence algorithm that is extremely aggressive to my channel, especially on uh, YouTube. So if you can, please click that like button. That may be very helpful. And there, uh, by the way, if by chance you are looking for more news from Russia, and commentary, you're more than welcome to join our tiny communities on uh, Patreon and Boosty. That will be a greater support of my work. Links are on this video in the description box and in the pinned comment. And now let's talk about news. And first of all, obviously, short summary of the situation on Ukrainian battlefield, where um, Kiev regime's defense lines are literally are collapsing, completely collapsing on South Donetsk sector of the frontline as a result of Russian local scale offensive operations, or I will even say sectoral scale offensive operation on South Donetsk direction, Russian troops established control over the uh, Novo Ukrainka settlement, over the Shakhtyorska settlement and Bogoyavlinka settlements. According to some reports, Shakhtyorska is still disputed between the sides, although uh, there was a report so that uh, Russian troops managed to establish full control over it, but when it comes to Novo Ukrainka and uh, Bogoyavlinka, these settlements are under full Russian control. Russian troops also significantly improving positions in Katerinovka and Elizabethovka areas. So, if this is not the total collapse of Kyiv regime's defense lines in this sector, then I don't know what word to use, how to describe the current situation. We may see, dear friends, a domino effect taking place, and there are some something similar might occur on other sectors of the front line in upcoming days. But when it comes to southern uh, Donetsk sector, uh, after establishing control over, over the, these uh, crucial settlements on the northern and northern western side of uh, Uglidar, which was liberated a couple of weeks ago, there is op operational space now uh, opened for uh, Russian troops and they can continue offensive on the northern side, northern eastern side to neutralize this uh, salient term between Bogoyavlinka and Kurakhova, for example, and Russian troops may conduct offensive operations uh, westward, uh, move uh, uh, westward also. Obviously, I don't know uh, what decision will be made, but my guess is that Russian troops now will focus probably to establish full control over their this line between uh, Kurakhova and uh, Bogoyavlinka and neutralize this salient in Possibly before end of this week, our entire this territory will be under full Russian control. And this is not all, dear friends. Russian troops, sir, as I reported yesterday, established full control over the Ismailovka and Garniak settlements, sir, and the clearing operation is underway in Kurakhovka settlement. Russian forces are operating to establish full control over this settlement. Also, and even bigger news, sir, if I may say this way, is coming from a little northern, uh, from the north. Um, Selidovo, by the way, Selidovo area, this settlement uh, is under full Russian control now. Many sources are confirming information that Selidovo was fully liberated by Russian troops and uh, not just Selidovo but Vishnyova also. Yesterday I predicted that something like that would happen and uh, now we are receiving information that that's exactly their case. Uh, Selidovo is completely under Russian control and also Vishnyova, Kyiv regime, uh, regime's troops uh, are running away from these uh, areas uh, and Russian forward units are now conducting operations in vicinity of Grigorivka on the northern side of uh, Vishnyova. Huge progress, obviously huge progress of the Russian armed forces in South Donetsk direction, in Pokrovsk direction. And as I said, uh, I would not be surprised at all if in uh, upcoming days we will see some sort of domino effect when uh, Kyiv regime's defense lines will will collapse in somewhat similar manner on other sectors of the front line, uh, especially because Russian troops are on a regular basis increasing pressure on Kyiv regime's formations in 
Toretsk direction, in Chisovyar direction, in Seversk direction, in Kupiansk direction, and obviously Russian troops are continuing counter-terrorist operation in Kursk salient area, which is shrinking and shrinking on daily basis, sir, despite all the attempts of the regime, uh, with their, uh, directing additional reinforcements in this area to maintain their positions, but they are unable to stop Russian advances, advancing forces. And uh, quite often, almost daily basis, now we are seeing uh, videos from Kursk salient area when uh, formations, units of the Kyiv regime uh, forces are chaotically withdrawing from their uh, positions, uh, quite often on a daylight in open field. Uh, probably that's what uh, panic does to, to people. They are just doing something that does not make no sense because uh, uh, if you are trying to save your life, then uh, then retreat nighttime or find some forestry area. But when there are tens or tens of troops of Kyiv simultaneously are running on open fields, and when they know, most likely they are watched by Russian drones. I mean, that's a quite suicidal action to take. It was a suicide to cross the border and uh, enter the Kursk region. And uh, I mean, they are proving on a daily basis uh, that, that they really are kind of suicidal because uh, actions of the Kyrgyz formations in uh, Kursk salient are less and less uh, make any, any sense. A uh, couple of days ago, uh, one of the high-ranking Russian officials even stated that the uh, Kyrgyz regime is losing control over their, its troops command and control over these troops in the Kursk salient area exactly because of this type of actions when some chaotic movements are taking place and there are, no one really understands what these troops are doing probably they don't know themselves either they are just running for uh, to save their lives that's it whenever they see approaching Russian forces that's what they do uh, instead of lay down arms and surrender which will uh, guarantee their survivability they are running away in open fields with their weapons on hands which means that uh, if they come up against russian unit then russian unit will have no time to start asking questions there they will open fire and neutralize that unit right anyways anyways uh, significant progress of the russian troops sir uh, all along the front line i will say but especially on the pokrovsk and Soldanetsk sectors initiative is in russian hands and there uh, as i said many times before in no universe key regime and their nato backers will be able to regain initiative on any of the directions sir, of the front line ever now let's go through some other news sir and there you know this report that during the night time russian air defense systems intercepted 21 drone that was launched by key regime to strike deep inside the russian uh, territory 13 drones were intercepted over the belgorod region six drones over the bryansk region also one drone over the Voronezh region and one drone over the Kursk region, but unfortunately, few drones managed to bypass Russian air defense systems. And there we have this report from governor of the Voronezh region, who basically uh, stated that two uh, enterprises were targeted. Let's let's read it. So Ukrainian UFs, or Ukrainian drones attacked two enterprises in the Aninsky and the Novo. Kopersky districts of the Voronezh region injuring two employees. Uh, Governor Alexander Gusev stated, and uh, obviously medics are doing whatever it takes to save the lives of these uh, injured uh, civilians. Uh, the condition of one is uh, serious, condition of other uh, is not life uh, threatening, according to reports that I read. The Glad newspaper is also reporting about quite interesting developments that took place um, in South Donetsk sector. Russian special forces, by the way, conducted their operation to evacuate their spy uh, that was uh, operating on Kyiv controlled territory for two years. And this spy, by the way, this uh, um, uh, spy was a U.S. citizen. Yes, you hear that, right? He was a U.S. citizen. He is a U.S. citizen. Let's go through this news. So Russian special services sir, have evacuated an American uh, who spent two years transmitting, transferring intelligence to the Russian side and uh, played an important role in the uh, storming of the village Neoglidar. The DPR defense headquarters stated Russian special services, Russian special forces basically, uh, and uh, 
and their, the military jointly evacuated the U.S. citizen who was passing important intelligence to the Russian troops. This was reported by the DPR Defense Headquarters. It is noted that the American played a significant role in the preparations of the operation to storm the village of Bogoyavlenko, which is liberated uh, by Russian forces, by the way, in the Uglidar direction. According to their headquarters, U.S. citizens spent two years in the territory controlled by Ukraine and transferred information that allowed the Russian military to deliver accurate strikes against the enemy while minimizing damage to civilian infrastructure and civilians. He played a key role in preparing their assault on uh, Bogoyavlinka settlements. So, quite interesting news, isn't it? That U.S. citizen was operating on a key controlled territory uh, as a Russian uh, intelligence uh, staff, in, uh, as a Russian intelligence member. He was not an uh, officer of Russian intelligence, sir, but uh, uh, because he was not citizen of Russia. But after his actions, sir, I'm quite sure, I'm quite sure, if he wants to, Russia, Russia, Russia will grant him uh, citizen, citizenship. Uh, this person, whose name is not uh, revealed to the public, clearly deserve, clearly deserve to become a Russian citizen if he wants to. Uh, obviously, so interesting story, isn't it? Uh, movies may be made on, on, on such stories, and who knows, maybe will be made. Anyways, let's continue, dear friends. Ria Novosti is reporting that Kyrgyz informations try to break through the borderline with Russia in the Bransk region, although Russian FSB units and their, um, and all their other militaries in the area were ready for such development and uh, destroy this in, in, invading forces, so Kyiv regime uh, was unable to establish foothold in the Bryansk region. Uh, not surprising, Kyiv regime is constantly trying to somehow slow down Russian counter-terrorist operation in the Kursk salient area, and uh, they are sending, and Kyiv is sending on suicidal operations, on suicidal missions, quite significant number of his troops uh, in, uh, in the Bryansk direction, in Belgorod direction, to cross the border and establish foothold, and also on different uh, parts of uh, borderline with the Kursk uh, region of uh, Russia. But yet again, Russian border guards, uh, Russian troops uh, that are uh, monitoring situation in, in on the borderline areas are ready to uh, neutralize such uh, threats that uh, are generated by the regime. Also, I guess you will find interesting this news that uh, Zelensky allows foreign mercenaries to serve as a Ukrainian army officers. RT is reporting about that. So Ukrainian leader Vladimir Zelensky has signed a law allowing foreign mercenaries to serve as officers in the country's military. The Ukrainian parliament, the Verkhovna Rada, passed the relevant legislation on October 10 and on Friday. It was signed into law by Zelensky, according to website of Ukrainian government. The law allows foreigners who have a contract with the Ukrainian military to take positions of authority in the army, regardless of their citizenship. And this information is obviously can be seen as an indicator, additional indicator of how desperate the regime are when it comes to manpower and not just the soldiers, but also officers. They have a significant lack of officers also. And this information. Uh, same time can be seen as an indicator that uh, probably NATO member states, number of NATO member states, not all of them, but some of them probably will now send their officers uh, directly into Ukrainian army. They will sign up contracts with their key regime's forces and they will serve uh, in there as a, as a officer. Sir. And can you imagine attitude that these so-called officers of the NATO will have? If, if uh, local officers, by the way, if citizens of uh, this uh, failed state that were officers in the Kyiv regime's army and are officers still uh, have no care about uh, casualties of their own personnel, and uh, if, if they were sending hundreds and thousands or tens of thousands of their troops on suicidal missions, can you imagine what these NATO officers will do? They will have no care about anybody, anybody, literally, right? And uh, well, 
I guess uh, this decision may even backfire because once uh, local soldiers will say will see that some foreigners are giving them orders to conduct some suicidal operations, I mean they will have additional reasoning to rebel, basically. And maybe they will. I'm kind of surprised uh, that uh, I mean that this this units of the Kyrgyzian forces did not yet take up arms and march on Kiev. I'm really surprised for that. But, uh, I mean, if foreign officers now are going to send them to die, then, I mean, what other reason do you want, really, to rebel? I don't, I don't know. Let's see. Let's see what is going to happen. And, dear friends, of course, sir, I have to share with you additional information, latest reports about situation in Georgia, where uh, on last Saturday, parliamentary elections took place in which uh, current ruling party, Georgian Dream, received about 54% of their votes sir, and the uh, majority basically in the parliament and if you remember i was predicting isn't it that most likely this western controlled so-called opposition will uh, whether decide to not recognize elections that's exactly what happened uh these so-called opposition parties that clearly are western assets by the way they refuse to recognize elections and now also western asset in georgia president of the republic Salome Zurabishvili is refusing, not just refusing to acknowledge or recognize elections results, but her calling people, she is calling people to go out on the streets and protest. And I predicted this also, isn't it? I said that that's what she will do, and she is doing this. So Georgia's president, Salome Zurabishvili, does not recognize the national parliamentary elections results and called on the people to join protests against it. The elections were held in Georgia on Saturday, according to official results. The ruling Georgian Dream Party received almost 54% of the votes, while various opposition forces uh, attracted between 11 and 3% of their votes. Uh, there is a 5% barrier, I believe, in Georgia. Uh, you have to reach at least 5% to be uh, eligible to you know, have a member uh, in the parliament. So earlier, the president uh, uh, claimed that uh, the vote was uh, won by what she's called uh, European Georgia, and despite uh, alleged attempts to rig the elections. On Sunday, she held uh, a series of meetings with uh, various opposition parties, several pro-Western opposition forces, including the Unity National Movement, which is uh, Saakashvili's party, by the way. Saakashvili is a former president of Georgia who sacrificed country once, in 2008, when he was president, under orders of Washington, when he reignited civil war in South Ossetia, uh, and then uh, and then provoke uh, provoke uh, military conflict with Russia by ordering fire to be opened on Russian peacekeepers in the region. So several pro-Western opposition forces, including the Unity of National Movement, uh, as I said, Saakashvili's party, also Coalition for Change announced her on the same day that they would not be joining the new parliament as they did not recognize the vote results. Either their parties, leaders accused the Georgian dream of what they called stealing the European future of Georgia and even supposedly staging a constitutional coup. Uh, I don't know, man. Uh, I don't know. Um, everything is happening as uh, it was predicted, right? And, uh, now everything depends on on unity of the public in georgia uh, obviously security services and armed forces have to stay out of politics sir, and the government of georgia have to share have to demonstrate her strength and their unity also otherwise if these uh, individuals by the way if western assets manage to overthrow government if they manage to conduct destabilize country conduct regime change and overthrow government Trust me, they're going to sacrifice Georgia once again. And they will, uh, and Western ruling uh, class uh, will, will use this, uh, their assets to use Georgia as a tool against Russia once again. So Georgian society, Georgian uh, government, everybody there that don't want Georgia to be sacrificed have to be uh, united and strong, 100%. And there are, probably you will hear quite a lot about Georgia nowadays in Western uh, propaganda outlets also, although 
I'm quite sure Western propaganda will uh, will uh, will be in full support of this so-called opposition, obviously, because they are assets of the West, right? Uh, well, Maria Zakharova, official representative of the Russian Foreign Ministry, commented on a statement of the Georgian president, Salome Zurobish. Uh, she, she was ironizing, kind of, and she said, how come that basically... Uh, uh, that uh, Georgian future for Georgia is uh, somehow worse than uh, European future, <laughs> right? Uh, this is an uh, irony, by the way. She was highlighting that this... Uh, Western assets, basically, these pro-Western forces are focused not on Georgia or Georgian interests. They are focused on interests of uh, outside forces, which is true, which is true. Everybody knows that, right? Also, you guess who is in support of this so-called Georgian opposition and who is criticizing current leadership? Boris Johnson, by the way, former prime minister of uh, uh, UK, United Kingdom, is a vocal once again, and this time he is uh, criticizing Georgia's leadership, Georgian government, and is in full support of this so-called opposition, which is once again completely under Western control. So Boris Johnson accused Georgian authorities of rigging the elections and their expressed support for their opposition. Former British Prime Minister Boris Johnson accused Georgian authorities of stealing the elections. According to Johnson, uh, their last elections was rigged. In his uh, microblog, the politician expressed support for the Georgian people. Yes, of course, uh, he so much cares. Uh, he has so much care about Georgian people in a very similar way that he has a care about uh, citizens of uh, Ukraine, isn't it? This another former Soviet Republic. I mean, he cared about uh, citizens of uh, Ukraine so much so that uh, basically, as a result of his involvement, uh, when. Uh, when negotiations between Moscow and Kiev was derailed in March, April 2002, uh, hundreds of thousands of citizens of Ukraine died on line of contact. And their blood is on hands of Boris Johnson and his bosses, right? Because we all understand that Boris Johnson is just a puppet. Real decision makers, real Western ruling class is a, is a group of some, some other people that are constantly in shadows, and they use such a personalities like Johnson, Macron, Biden, Scholz, Moltz, and the rest of the garbage, actually, uh, as their tools, isn't it? So yes, Boris Johnson is in full support of the so-called opposition, absolutely unsurprisingly. So, and also, also by the way, uh, media, Western media, uh, at least uh, some of them in Germany, in, in, uh, in other countries, were very critical of their ruling party and uh, you know, openly supporting opposition. Openly supporting opposition. And therefore, uh, that's why I'm saying you're going to hear about Georgia quite a lot in upcoming days, I guess, uh, because uh, West will... Most likely, Western ruling class will use whatever assets they have in Georgia to overthrow government, conduct regime change, and then sacrifice Georgia as kind of second front against uh, Russia. Although, by the way, thanks God, not everybody among Western ruling elites are um, criminals. There are some uh, good people also there. And, uh, and among these good people... Uh, Viktor Orban is uh, obviously uh, one of the uh, leading figures, sir. Uh, I will say, and he 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 actually congratulated. He actually congratulated uh, uh, his colleague, Prime Minister of Georgia, Irakli Kobahidze, says uh, parliamentary elections. Uh, well done, well done to Hungary. Obviously, Orban knows perfectly well what is going on in Georgia. He knows perfectly well that the Western ruling class wants to sacrifice Georgia, right? Conduct regime change and then sacrifice Georgia. And he's against it. He's against it. He don't want war to continue, uh, this proxy war against Russia to continue uh, in Ukraine. And he don't want Georgia to be used also as a proxy against, her, against Russia. And therefore, he was one of the first leaders, world leaders, who, co who called uh, Tbilisi and congratulated her Georgian uh, leadership. 
Well done. Well done. Obviously, Hungary's leadership. Slovakia's current leadership, Serbia's leadership, they are they are demonstrating as much as they can, by the way, that uh, they are for peace. They are for peace. And also, by the way, Prime Minister of Georgia, Irakli Kubahidze, spoke about her uh, uh, situation in, in Georgia. He stated that her uh, government will do whatever it takes to make sure that country is not destabilized, uh, despite all the attempts from this uh, so-called opposition. And uh, he spoke that uh, he, he said that her uh, new newly elected parliament will shortly appoint new government, and uh, and probably he will maintain uh, post of prime minister. I guess so. And he also spoke about uh, foreign policy for the next uh, years, and uh, he he was asked about. Uh, by journalists uh, about relationships with Russia, if uh, Tbilisi has any plans to restore diplomatic relationships with Moscow. And he said that, uh, no, in, in foreseeable future, diplomatic relationships with Moscow will not be restored due to significant differences uh, of the sides when it comes to South City and Abkhazia, uh, that Georgia sees as a breakaway region sir, of, uh, of Georgia, uh, but Russia recognizes independence of this uh, republics, and this is a big obstacle, obviously, for the sides to reestablish uh, uh, diplomatic relationships. Although, although Prime Minister of Georgia continued that her uh, government will will uh, will uh, pursue similar pragmatic uh, policies when it comes to relationships with Russia to secure uh, to secure um, Georgia to secure best interests of uh, citizens of Georgia. And that pragmatic approach is definitely what Georgia is needed. And I remind you, dear friends, that since the collapse of Soviet Union, since the collapse of Soviet Union, country had a 10 years, decade of peace first time. Can you imagine that? Under Georgian dream leadership, country had the first time in last decade, more than a decade, peace. When uh, there was no internal military confrontation and there was no military confrontation with their neighbor, right? And this is the, in case of Georgia, when there was constantly some disturbances and conflicts and so on, in case of Georgia, this is achievement that should not be taken as granted, right? Hard work needs to be put in place to make sure that there is a stability and there is a peace, right? Nothing, nothing should be taken uh, granted, right? Uh, although, by the way, when it comes to when it comes to the uh, situation uh, around South City and Abkhazia, I said many times before, by the way, and uh, I am trying to promote this idea as, as far as I, I remember myself, by the way, last 25, 30 years maybe. And I was saying that confederacy, confederacy is a way forward, right? Tbilisi, Tsinwali, and Sukhumish political class. They should find their strength in themselves to move forward with the idea of confederacy. They should get united under the umbrella of confederacy, which is not going to be easy, by the way. Process will, will take uh, sometimes years, I guess, but it's doable. It's doable. Sides may get united under the confederacy with, uh, let's say, uh, voluntarily uh, moratorium of leaving confederacy for uh, 15, 25 years. Uh, and uh, I'm 100% convinced, by the way, give these people 25 years of, uh, of peace. And after 25 years, none of the parties, by the way, not Tbilisi, not Srinwale, not Sukhum, will have not even uh, think about, will not even think about leaving the confederacy because it would be successful state. I believe in that, right? And if sides will move towards confederacy, Moscow will not just, would not be against it, but Moscow most likely will even uh, support that idea because in that case, Moscow don't have to withdraw no recognition of independence of nobody. Moscow will just recognize this newly created state, confederacy, and that will help to resolve significant uh, number of issues that Tbilisi and Moscow have in the, in the relationships. Right, not all, but significant 
number of issues, major issues even. So uh, hopefully, hopefully in next three to five years, that's exactly what is going to happen and their, and their sides will move towards confederacy. And uh, if so, then Russia will recognize this new confederation, new state, and Tbilisi and Moscow will have, a, have no reason to not to restore diplomatic relationships, right? Anyways, anyways, dear friends, let's continue. I want to make this update as short as possible, but it's already 30 minutes. I will go through at least headlines, dear friends, sir. So RT is reporting that, uh, well, entire northern Gaza population is at risk of dying, according to UN. What Israeli forces are doing in a besieged Gaza during their ongoing war against Hamas cannot be allowed to continue. United Nations top humanitarian official has stated the entire population of the North Gaza is at risk of dying. Josie Msua, acting under Secretary General for the Humanitarian Affairs and the UN Emergency Relief Coordinator, warned on Saturday in a post on X. Israel has uh, struck hospitals in the region, detained, uh, detained health workers and prevented first responders from rescuing people trapped under the rubble, according to their official shelters, have been uh, emptied and burned down. Families have been separated and the men and boys taken away by their truckload. She said, adding that such a blatant disregard for basic humanity and for the laws of war must stop. Well, will uh, Netanyahu and his... Uh, Associates will listen to statements of UN official. Unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, I think so. I think they will not. They will not. They are emboldened to, to do whatever they want. And uh, I really don't see how this uh, madness can be stop this this tragedy human tragedy in the middle east and their madness on part of uh, israeli leadership theoretically speaking washington can influence the situation big time theoretically speaking because of israeli's dependence on washington but uh, as we see for uh, past year washington is not willing to do anything at all just the statements time to time that's all and that's unfortunate reality by the way rt is reporting that trump promises not to fight a foreign war so former u.s president donald trump has promised not to send americans to fight and die in a countries they have never even heard of while addressing a crowd in their battleground state of uh, pennsylvania this weekend well, statement is good. Statement is good, but uh, will will he follow on his statements? Uh, only time will tell. If, of course, uh, he will be elected uh, as a president. Also, RT is reporting that Musk, Elon Musk, promises to cut U.S. budget by two trillion under Trump. Tesla and SpaceX CEO Elon Musk made an um, appearance at the Donald Trump's rally at uh, Madison Square Garden, promising to save American taxpayers trillions of dollars under his uh, hypothetical second administration, under Trump's second administration, despite uh, previously proclaimed uh, his political neutrality. Musk uh, has uh, leaned towards uh, Trump in recent months, publicly endorsing him after the first assassination attempt. Following this, Trump promised that if he wins the November election, he will establish a government efficiency commission headed by their billionaire entrepreneur and uh, well that's what uh, elon musk wants to do basically um as he uh, walked on the stage in new york on sunday musk was asked how much do you think uh, we can cut from this western wasted 6.5 trillion harris biden budget and uh, musk said that uh, i think we can do at least two trillion um, electing load chairs from the crowd uh, at the end of the day all government spending is a uh, taxation 
whatever is uh, direct taxation or government spending, it either leads to inflation or becomes direct taxation. Um, well, obviously, U.S. needs to cut on spending, isn't it? I mean, you don't have to be genius on, on finances to, to know that. Well, already, U.S. debt is uh, like 35 trillion uh, and growing and growing. So I don't know if Musk will be able in reality to cut spending for two trillion a year. But if he does, then uh, who knows? Maybe maybe US would not borrow at least trillions. Uh, right? Maybe US will start uh, living on the on the money that it, it has, actually. Who knows? But uh, it, it is obvious that uh, some cuts have to be made in, in spending because uh, Washington is spending these trillions like uh, there is no tomorrow. And this cannot continue forever, isn't it? RT is reporting that former Bolivian president survives assassination attempt. So former Bolivian president Evo Morales have survived an assassination attempt. Video published on his Facebook page on Sunday suggests, and I shared this video, by the way, on my Telegram channel. Many of you probably see it. Uh, if not, you can you can check it out if you're if you're interested. Yes, he was moving on a car, by the way, and uh, this car was shot at uh, by fourteen times, I believe. Um, and uh, his driver was wounded, but the driver managed to you know uh, continue driving the car and uh, take her Morales towards the safety. So, I mean, there are some disturbances in Bolivia, by the way, and uh, we all understand why, isn't it? We all understand why. Uh, there are so many interests that are, you know, in conflict there, global interests. And Bolivia, I remind you, dear friend, is one of the richest countries when it comes to rare earth materials. And that said it all, isn't it? That said it all. Das News Agency is reporting that uh, Finance Minister of the Russian Federation, Silvano, stated that the uh, payment system for BRICS is a uh, is necessity. It's a uh, it's uh, absolutely necessity, uh, and uh, I agree with him. Uh, you know, I agree with him. I was uh, talking about this topic for so long that uh, it is uh, necessary, absolutely necessary for a BRICS and for this world that alternative financial and the banking system needs to be created, to be created. I mean, it's just, it it has to be done. Uh, and that's why I was a little bit disappointed, by the way, when I did not hear statements, many statements. There was some information about possible steps that BRICS member states will take her in, in terms of uh, financial cooperation and, and, and stuff. Um, during the Kazan Big Summit, but uh, I was expecting some uh, some announcements to be made about uh, creation of their systems. I mean, not just the statements, not just good wishes and, and that kind of stuff, but concrete steps. And probably, probably, I mean, work will continue in this way. Uh, I can understand that uh, this is not an easy topic uh, to work with, obviously, but it's, it has to be done. So creating a payment system for the BRICS countries is a vital necessity. This was stated by the uh, Minister of Finances of the Russian Federation, Anton Siluanov. Let's uh, translate a little more here. Uh, this is vital necessity, he said in a comment to uh, Russian media journalist Pavel Zarubin, Vigaderka, journalist Pavel Zarubin, for the Moscow Kremlin Putin program. If the current and familiar uh, system fails and does not work, then we need to create an alternative. Some people are uh, satisfied with their current system, but their alternative is always better if there is one. The head of the Russian finance minister explained the 16th BRICS summit, which is a key event of the Russian presidency in the association, was held in Kazan from October 2022 to 2024. On the second day of the summit, the participants adopted the Kazan declaration. Among the main topics of the document are the development of their association, 
the position on the global issues and the settlement of regional crises, including in Ukraine and the Middle uh, Eastern. Okay, we all know that. So yes, that's all. Uh, basically, that's it. No details, no details, by the way. Or at least it is good that at least our high ranking officials are acknowledging that uh, it is vital, vital net necessity to create a payment system, alternative payment system, alternative to the Western ones that are weaponized, obviously, by Western ruling class. And the alternative financial and banking system needs to be needs to be done. And uh, I don't know, maybe some BRICS member states, uh, you know, are not that keen at this point to you know to to conduct any any real steps in this direction. But uh, I don't know, man. I don't know. They may they may come under Western sanctions like that, isn't it? At any point, whenever Western ruling class will not like anything that these BRICS member states that may be opposing creation of alternative financial and banking system will do, they will come under sanctions and uh, and I don't think uh, they have to wait for that moment exactly to realize how important it is to have an uh, alternative. But I'm a bit disappointed, by the way. I'm at this point a bit disappointed that Bixer did not yet come out or come up with their alternatives, man. There are too much talks. Some work is done, by the way, separately. I mean, Russia is working on this direction. Don't get me wrong. In, in Russia, there are several systems that are working, and there are many businesses, many countries are using this, uh, these systems. But this is a Russian system, right? And uh, I want uh, BRICS to have a system, payment system, financial and banking system that will be alternative for entire world, right? Alternative to the Western one. And uh, unfortunately, BRICS is a bit slow on that. Russia is moving much faster with creating uh, with creations of uh, of Russian payment systems, right? Uh, BRICS needs to catch up. Bricks definitely needs to catch up, man. And this is it, dear friends. This is it uh, for now. Um, it is relatively long update, but uh, packed with uh, important, in my opinion, and interesting news. Hopefully, you will find this update also interesting. And if so, please click that like button if you uh, didn't uh, yet. Uh, and leave some commentary just about anything, dear friends. Any topic will uh, will do. Uh, maybe if likes will reach thousand, algorithm will treat video a little differently. I don't know, but uh, at least we can try, isn't it? And when comments will reach certain number, maybe algorithm will start treat video differently. I don't know details of uh, works of, of that algorithms, but uh, my channel is in shadow ban. Uh, Videos are suppressed big time. Even members of our community are not receiving notifications, by the way, and not seeing my videos in our recommendations. And they are subscribers. They should, right? Uh, but uh, that's what happens with shadow channels that are in shadow ban, right? And suppressed. And uh, well, if you can, yes, please click that like button, leave some commentary. And uh, if you like my work, if you want to see further development of this small media project of mine, with several channels on YouTube, Rumble, Telegram. Please consider to support my work with uh, small donations through PayPal or Boosty platforms or by subscribing to my Patreon page and or on page on Boosty, by the way. I'm publishing extra content on Patreon and Boosty. Uh, all the links are under this video in the description box and in the pinned. This is it for now. This is it for now. As I said, later on today, in the evening time, I will have a second uh, news update on Patreon and Boosty. And uh, if you are not a member of our community there, please consider to join. Have a great day and take care.